This is where people get in a lot of trouble. There's a really good book called How Not to Read the Bible. Uh -huh. And this is one of his main points. And he, he just takes this tons of memes from online yeah. and just how people are just bashing Christianity, like about slavery, self shellfish, women, like uh -huh. all these things, because they're just taking one line out of context mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're missing the point. Welcome to the Loving God, Loving People podcast, where we talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus in our everyday lives and how, in the end, all that matters is God and people. Here's today's episode. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm sitting down with Justin Martz, who Chad lovingly refers to as the professor. Uh, Justin, thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking about the Bible. So I'm going to give a little background. Um, so several years ago, we were looking at what can we do for our staff who don't have biblical training? Like they didn't go to Bible college. Uh, maybe they came from the business world or education, and now they're working at the church, but we want them to have a Bible foundation. So we started brainstorming, yeah. hey, how can we teach our staff the Bible and created a, a one-year course that we take our, our staff through? And uh, Justin teaches that. He leads that. So today we're going to talk with the entire church or to those who listen to the podcast. And and Justin, talk to us about how to study the Bible and, and what are some kind of guidelines as we, as we open up this ancient document or collect Yes. Of, of books um, that we can study it and glean from it and apply it to our lives. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, the very first step, I think, in this process is, is to view the Bible correctly. Mm -hmm. The Bible is a unified story that leads us to Jesus. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of like a tagline for like the Bible project, if people are familiar with that. But, but to come to the Bible with the right lenses on mm -hmm. is really important uh, because sometimes we bring our own questions and things to the text um, that it wasn't necessarily meant to answer to begin with. Um, for instance, you know, we might bring a lot of science questions to it. Well, the Bible is not a science book, although it, it teaches us some things about science. Mm -hmm. It's not a history book, but it teaches us some things about history and, and things like that. Yeah. What the Bible is, is a unified story that leads us to Jesus. And yeah. like you just mentioned, um, it's more than a book. We, th we think of it that way, mm -hmm. but it is a it's an ancient library. Mm -hmm. It's this ancient unified library of, of ancient scrolls dating back two to four plus thousand years old that have been brought together um, around this single theme, mm -hmm. right? So as you open the Bible and you start with page one, um, you immediately learn about who God is, yep. what a human is, our sin issue, and then you start collecting data on who the Messiah will be. What is God's plan to restore relationship with, with humanity? Um, so again, if you've got to, if you've got to read the Bible with the right set of lenses. Mm -hmm. And so as you move through the Old Testament, which is um, really the Jewish Bible, um, you start collecting a profile of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And I even, in class, I say it's like if you have a file cabinet and you just have a file called the Messiah file. Yep. And you start putting things in there. Oh, he's from the line of David. He's a seed from Abraham. You know, mm -hmm. he's a priest. Da, 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 da. And so then what happens I mean, when you get to the New Testament, the gospel authors are just pulling those files out and saying, oh, Jesus is this. Yeah. This, this is why Jesus is this. this is why Jesus... So then you're like, oh, okay, I can see that. I can connect that. And Jesus, he he quotes the Old Testament some, I, I forget the exact number, maybe like 80 times or whatever oh, that he references yeah. the Old Testament. So all throughout his ministry, his teaching, his life, he's pointing us back to, okay, That's right. I am fulfilling all of these things. And, yes. and you see him hint at it. And sometimes he just flat out says, this is being fulfilled in your hearing right, <laughs> right now. Yeah. Like this thing that Isaiah wrote, this is me. Yeah, and, he's uh, the fulfillment of, um, you know, Sabbath and Jubilee there in yep. Isaiah. Um, so he's not only fulfilling prophecies, we, we focus on those a lot, like mm -hmm. where he's born or things like that. Um, even Chad this weekend talking about um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and mm -hmm. how the Messiah will be in a rich man, you know, buried yep. by a rich man, yep. like all that stuff. But also the pictures we get from the Old Testament, Correct. like he's yeah. a, he is the ideal priest. Mm -hmm. He is the ideal sacrifice. He is the ideal prophet, you know, and all these things. He fulfills all of the Old Testament. And, and we learn as you, as you read through the Old Testament, we learn that there's patterns and, mm -hmm. and that none of us, even the holiest of holy, whatever, can keep all of the law. Like, and you see the cycle of trying, succeeding a little bit, but then failing and, and it repeats. And even yeah. our heroes of the Bible, they fail. And so you also start to pick up this theme of like, oh, we need a savior. Yeah. Like we cannot, we cannot be good on our own. And, and it's really building the case for thousands of years of there's no way to God except through a, a sacrifice, a savior, yeah. a rescuer who has to live a perfect life. And so it's just building up to, to the life of Jesus. And there's stories too that, that kind of echo or mirror things that happen in the New Testament that aren't necessarily prophetic, but then they kind of become prophetic, yeah, right? That's right. Where even, um, I, I was studying recently, Jesus is 
at the Last Supper, and he quotes from a psalm where David's lamenting. He has a friend who betrays him. Yeah. And the friend yeah, who yeah. he sits at the table with and eats with uh, betrays him, is, is doing that for, you know, money kind of off to the side, gets caught, ends up killing himself. And it's like this perfect parallel of Judas. And so right. Jesus is quoting that, talking about how he's going to be betrayed and like, yeah. hey, this thing that happened to David is happening to me right now. And and so you have moments like that too, all throughout the Old Testament that you see paralleled in the New Testament. Yeah. When the New Testament writers are crafting their, their books, right, it's divinely inspired, but also written by these human authors. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're assuming that their readers are entrenched in the Old Testament the way they are. Yeah. And they're viewing reality through this lens that the, the, Old Testament is a unified story that leads to the Messiah, and then the New Testament's Jesus. And mm-hmm. so who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. And then now how do you live life as a follower of Jesus? Um, but the problem is we're not, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yep. We're not that entrenched, or we don't understand that much. So we do the research, and we find out, and we see those awesome things. But you're so, right. With, when it comes to, sorry, when it comes to humanity, um, one of the big pictures is no matter where a human is, like you could be in the garden with God mm-hmm. in a situation that's ideal and you're still going to fall, mm-hmm. right? You can be David, who's like this perfect, you know, king. Uh, and Faith you're still, in God, you're kills still gonna Goliath. Fall, yep. right? You can be Solomon, who's pictured as the wisest man in the world. You're still going to fall. You can right? be one of the disciples yeah. and the disciples fall away. Yeah. They, they scatter. Like everybody is, is in that same category. Nobody's exempt, including you, including me. Um, talk about this because it you you mentioned this. It is written to specific audiences. Yes. And sometimes we miss that. So yeah. unpack that. Yeah, for that's us. great. That's kind of the second step then in the process is the Bible wasn't written to us, mm-hmm. but for us. And that's sometimes difficult for people to grasp. But as we start reading scripture, we have to say, okay, uh, what was the authorial intent originally mm-hmm. to the group of people? If it was the ancient Israelites or maybe the church in Corinth or Galatia or whatever that was. So what was the authorial intent? Mm -hmm. So you have an author, you have an audience. Yeah. yeah. And then what would the original hearer or reader understand Mm -hmm. listening or hear or reading that text? Yeah. And so that takes work, right? So we got to think culture, Mm -hmm. language, history, um, even the literary genre that it's in all these different things as the original hearer is thinking about their life. I always call it like an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So we all have an encyclopedia that we develop over the course of our life. Yeah. And so if I want to understand my wife, for instance, really well, I need to know her encyclopedia, mm-hmm. which which is different than mine. But the more I understand it, the more I invest in it, the more I know her. Mm-hmm. And so I can pick up on the things that she says or does that yep. might be different, right, than what I do. So we have to understand the encyclopedia of the minds of the mm-hmm. original hearers mm-hmm. and readers. So that takes, okay, what did what did the culture what was the Roman culture like, right? Yeah. Even um, this week I was reflecting on um, Romans 16, right? When, when a patriarchal uh, Roman culture, uh, and as Paul is thanking all these people that have a significant role in the, in, the, in the ministry and the growth of the church, out of the 24 names, 10 are women. Mm-hmm. 10 are women. For us, we read it. We're like, great, list of names. Not that exciting. Yep. Uh, but for almost half of his list to be women, mm-hmm. especially in that day and time, should really stand out to us. Yeah. And we, really, we need to think about, man, what were the roles of these women in the in the growth of that first church? And, and as people are kind of evaluating, doing their research, understanding who's it written to, what's the cultural context, how did they hear it, how did they understand it, yeah. uh, the Bible always means what it always meant. That's and right. so... There's a tendency sometimes in church or, you know, different movements of like, whether it's, you know, health and wealth gospel, where sure. they'll take something and they'll twist it to to fit a different narrative, yeah. but that's not how it was interpreted or received or understood. And and what that is, is that's manipulating. And yeah. that's not actually doing good understanding and, and exegesis, which is just unpacking what does the Bible say and, and mean. Um, it's it's manipulating it, which people have been manipulating sure. the Bible for years, as long as it's been around. Um, and so it's important not to take our culture and our encyclopedia and, right. and put it on yeah. the words of scripture, but to understand what was their encyclopedia yeah. and to run it through that filter. Because the second step in that process is once I understand the best of my ability um, by either doing research or, or tr- trusting or whatever the people that I, I read 
or listen to, then I ask, okay, what does that mean for me now? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we come to the text and just immediately ask, okay, what does this mean for me now? But we first have to say, what did it mean to them? Yep. And then how do, how I, do, apply I, that? How do yep. I apply that? How do I contextualize it? In my context, it to, in my world, in my you know, life. Gilbert, yep. Arizona, 2023, yep. right? It's going to be a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned a couple. Give us give us another one as we're looking yep. at scripture and understanding. And by the way, for people that start in Genesis, they're yes. probably going, this is a unified story because Genesis is great. It is very narrative. Um Talk us through the different genres here to yeah. give us a little bit of understanding, because people will start in Genesis, and then Exodus, okay, and then Leviticus are like, oh, man. And if they make it to Numbers, then they're done. That's right. Like, yeah. That's usually yeah, 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 how yeah. it goes. Yeah, that's one of the steps is to understand the the literary genre of, of Scripture. Um, as, again, it's a, it's a divine and human kind of partnership, mm -hmm. the words that God wants to be written, but using human, you know, the artistry and the... And so the... To say there's there's it's literature mm -hmm. and there's different genres used is okay, and to say okay what rules do I apply um, mm -hmm. to to read for instance the Torah which is Genesis to Deuteronomy mm -hmm. so from a Jewish perspective it's it's one book it's almost like a five part book yep. more than five separate books but it's a certain type of genre because it's it's a lot of narrative so mm -hmm. that's one thing how do I interpret narrative stories yep uh, but then it also includes law codes yep uh, which is another type of of literary genre right so how do I interpret law codes? codes in the midst of the narrative is it as i'm reading this narrative then i'm getting an insert into okay now the, how did the people live and mm -hmm. what how did god use them and how he was working with them and and then again it was written to this ancient israel group going into the promised land so then what does it mean for me today mm -hmm. is different than just saying okay let me take this verse or this verse and and, try and a to lot of that life. ceremonial law that that stopped with the, the resurrection of Jesus, that that mm. system, uh, that the sacrificial system and all of that, that was done away with. Yeah. Jesus is the high priest that we never had, that we, you know, Israel had. And it was, again, it was a picture of, hey, we, yeah. need, we need a permanent sacrifice. We need not just a covering of sin, we need a removal of sin. And that happens through Jesus. And so that system is done with, but it, it prepares and it, it, it guides us and leads us up to that moment yeah. with Jesus. So, um, yeah, so all that ceremonial law is done with. If ever I had a chance one time to go to the state capitol, and it was like, hey, you can come in, and we're, you know, they're they're doing the Congress meeting stuff, and they're voting on different bills and all of that, and just them reading the law, <laughs> I was like, oh, man. And they have a guy who's like an auctioneer kind of guy. Sure. Like the, remember the old micro machine oh, commercials where the guy talks yes, super fast? Yeah, There's yeah. a guy, his job, because they have to before they vote, even though they've already read it and had their lawyers look at it and all of that. In the, the session, they have to read the entire law, and so a guy just sits there and, like, micro-machine. Nobody understands yeah. a word he's saying, but <laughs> it's just vote. part of the yeah. system. So he reads it. I was like, man, this is boring. Uh, so yeah. if ever you've gotten into, like, Leviticus, and you're like, man, this rule, yeah. and then if this happens, you got to pay this person this, and this is how you deal with this disagreement, or, you know— you're reading law, yeah. like you're reading like Article Five, yeah. Article Six. Like, you're and it, how I explain it is kind of like this: if if I were to write a narrative story about the life of, let's say, Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. right? So it's a narrative, and then within that narrative, I'm going to put in the construction of the Constitution mm -hmm. and, and even just quote it all. Yep. Right. I'm not writing a law book. I'm writing a narrative about something, but it includes laws. Yes. Right. Yep. And those laws then aren't for me to to apply. It's to tell me about what was happening. Mm -hmm. If I would just hand you a constitution, that's a law book, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's kind of different things. Yeah. Yeah. So different genres. So historical, yeah. you mentioned, there's law, uh, there's ancient poetry. Yeah, poetry it has its own rules. And mm -hmm. now there's a lot of types, of, like lines, like mm -hmm. A and B and ABBA, and yep. comparison and contrast of lines. You have the book of Psalms, which is its own thing. It's, mm -hmm. a, you know, the, the construction of these texts and then how they were brought together over time. Um, the more you dig into this, these literary genres and the and the beauty um, that's a part of it, actually, like I, I think it enhances mm -hmm. how we read scripture, yeah. how we understand it, the beauty beauty of God and how He reveals His Word and and the human hands in it. And there's a the divine element when you take history, law, ancient poetry, yeah. prophetic writing, that's right, wisdom literature, and and you compile all of this together, and yet to your point at the beginning of this. Jesus is a thread that holds That's it all right. together. Like, people can't just make that no. up. That, yeah. is, that is a divinely inspired uh, signature. That, yeah, it that would all be like us together. starting to write something today, and then thousands of years later, there's been consistent writing from different people mm -hmm. around the world. And then they all it all that comes together like it's just mind blowing when you and really part of the law it. and the culture is 
maintaining it, right? Yeah. And and the office of the scribes that would word for word, letter for letter, copy over. Yeah, you know where we get our. This is where we get our manuscripts. Yes. and this is also why we know uh, definitively that today what we have in the Bible is what we've always had because of the office of the scribe and because ancient manuscripts like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yep. Um, there was a archaeological discovery and they found these rolled up silver scrolls sure. and punched yeah. in it was the Aaronic blessing, not That's ironic right. yeah. blessing, Aaronic yeah. blessing. Uh, dating back to pre-exilic Israel. So previous to Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC, uh, when he destroys Israel and takes them into captivity, and you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and all yes. of that, prior to that, these scrolls were made, yeah. and they were hidden for thousands of years. And then we just recently discovered them, and it's like, oh, what they had then is exactly what we have now. Yeah, yeah. So the more they find, the more, um, you know, the, it's called textual criticism, but mm -hmm. we have more more documents closer to the original ones than mm -hmm. any other ancient literature. That's right. Things that people assume are historical, um, it's it's uncomparable, mm -hmm. uh, the amount that we have. And as we find more and more ancient texts and say, okay, look, it's, it's the same. Yeah. It's, it's, it just adds to the validity of it. And again, to the divine hand that you see on scripture, you mentioned this is written not to us, but it is written for yeah, us. And right. God has preserved this for us uh, for thousands of yeah. years. It's his love letter to us to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. A great example of that is like, for instance, you mentioned the prophets, which is mm -hmm. its own kind of genre mm -hmm. of literature. And uh, then you have like even the gospels as a genre and letters as a genre, yep. right? And apocalyptic literature as a genre, but prophets. So if, if, if I'm not, there's a, there's a good thing to say. It says, um, text versus event, right? I try to teach the students mm -hmm. that. And so I'm reading a text about an event. I'm not there experiencing the event myself. So I had an old professor and he would say, imagine a grandfather and a grandson are walking through the, the Red Sea as it's parted. Mm -hmm. And the grandson looks up and says, what does this mean? And the grandfather says, wait to read the book. Because <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah. assume it means all these things about who God is, his character. Mm -hmm. But what the Bible does, um, it, it's telling us about those events and what they mean for salvation history. Mm -hmm. So we weren't the audience of, let's say, Isaiah, mm -hmm. as he was historically speaking to the kingdom yep. and the people. What we have is his his work within the confines of, of the Old Testament, specifically the prophet section. And then what we're reading about is how his work really connects then to, to the Messiah, mm -hmm. right? Who will this Messiah be? He's going to be a, a seed from, from the Israelite kingdom that's, that's you know, cut up and burned down in a, a tree stub and all these things, right? So it's really fascinating. You got to, again, understand it from the a biblical context. Yeah, and even in Isaiah, since you're mentioning Isaiah, so this is written hundreds of years before Jesus, and he's saying, "Hey, here's he's the suffering servant, Service, and here's yeah, what, yeah, right. here's what the Messiah is going to look like. This is what's going to happen to the Messiah. This is like giving all of this context, so that when yeah. Jesus arrives, people can go, oh." Isaiah mentioned this, and this is happening exactly as Isaiah said it. Oh, we have this in Psalm 22. Jesus quotes it on the cross, and we see the details of Psalm right. 22 happening at this moment on the cross, that Jesus is showing us, like, hey, this is the plan. This has always been the plan. Yeah. Um, so I know this is kind of an aside. One thing that fascinates me, because you, you mentioned that this is the Jewish Bible, mm -hmm. and when I travel to Israel and I'm at the Western Wall and I see people wailing going, hey, we want to get back to this place yeah. where the, the temple once was, and we want to get back to the sacrificial system. Uh, the Bible talks about that that the eyes of the Jewish people would be, would be blinded yeah. to the reality of the Messiah. So help me, help us understand, how is this possible? Because I look at the Old Testament, <laughs> right. I go, man, I see Jesus all over the pages, yeah. yet there's people who know it far better than I do, and, and they don't see yeah. Jesus. So how... How does that happen? Yeah, first, I think there is a, a divine thing there because I think in Peter, he even says like the they've been hardened so that mm -hmm. more people can come, more Gentiles can come into faith, which is great. Um, and it doesn't mean that all Jews are hardened or mm -hmm. don't see it um, because I like to listen to a lot of like Messianic Jewish podcasts yep. or, or things like that. Yeah, I have friends who are Messianic yeah. Jews. Um, which Insights which, are brilliant. Yeah, brilliant, right? Because yeah. I'm like, okay, that's I need to know that. Again, mm -hmm. going back to that encyclopedia, yeah, they already have the encyclopedia. They understand the Jewish. cultural stuff yeah. that's not in the Bible, but it's part of the Jewish culture that yeah. Jesus would have experienced that they continue to this day. Yeah. Things like Shabbat and how they welcome the Shabbat and how they do Passover meal and all of that. So. Yeah, so um, I remember listening to one specific Specifically, um, and he was saying how his parents, as, as he grew up, they weren't, you know, they wouldn't even entertain Christianity or being a Messianic mm -hmm. Jew. Even he said Jesus was like the most kept secret of in Judaism, mm -hmm. although Jesus was Jewish. Yep, you know? yep. And uh, he said his mom actually um, accepted Jesus as her savior um, through 
I forget how, but anyway, she did. And she kept trying to talk to the father about it. And he just like would dismiss, dismiss. And then she, finally she said, let me, can I read something to you? Hmm. And he goes, yes, but nothing from the New Testament, right? It was just like this hardening of like, yep. I don't want to hear it. Yep. So she read him Isaiah, uh, part of Isaiah 53. Yep. And he said, I told you not to read me anything from the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> that's the suffering servant part. And so she goes, no, that's from Isaiah. And so um, that actually helped him wow. see it mm-hmm. then that it, there is this suffering part of the Messiah. It yep. wasn't just all the king part that, you know, the everybody the focused on. Yeah. yeah. There's another part of the dying Messiah that has to defeat sin, evil, and death so that we can have the renewed relationship with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a couple other things as we're looking at the Bible, a couple other like yeah. filters or guides as we, as we want to interpret and understand the Bible. Uh, so you mentioned, understand that it's the thread is Jesus all the yeah. way throughout. It's written for you, but not to you, uh, different literary genres. That's right. Uh, what else? Never read one verse. Okay. And, uh, and context. And context. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is key um, because we do this a lot. Uh, and even when we do it, even like for our devos, it, there's background work there mm-hmm. to help, you know, understand, like we do some work to help illustrate something. Yeah. Um, but this is where people get in a lot of trouble. There's a really good book called How Not to Read the Bible. Uh-huh. And this is one of his main points. And he, he just takes this tons of memes from online yeah, and just how people are just bashing Christianity, like about slavery, self- shellfish, women, like uh-huh. all these things, because they're just taking one line out of context mm-hmm. and they're, and they're missing the point. When just you, like if you were to listen to say Chad sermon from this last weekend or whatever, you could probably take out a sentence sure. and by itself, you'd go, what? Yeah. <laughs> what, what is that? What, yeah. What yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah, or okay. part of a sentence yeah. and, and go, oh man, well, that's the same thing. When you look at scripture, there's, there's, it's a thought within a bigger thought within a bigger context yeah. uh, with a with a clear thread and narrative. And so understanding the bigger context helps us understand the, the smaller verses. That's right. Every verse is part of a paragraph, which is part of a like a section, which mm-hmm. is part of a, a letter or book, yep. which is then part of a collection. Let's say all of Paul's writings and what does he say that's similar or, you know, the – you know, a testament in the, in the Bible. The, even when you guys did the podcast about you know women in ministry, and you said, okay, what's the what's the Bible say about mm-hmm. it? Let's let's glean information. Yep. Is it ever celebrated? Is yeah. it ever yeah? That's what's that's moral what you have law? to yep. keep moving out and not just focus on that one little verse because we would we wouldn't do that. Again, this goes back to it being literature. Mm-hmm. Um, it, any pick up any book that you're reading, mm-hmm. you wouldn't just go to one page and read like a, a couple lines and think that you've understand the book, right? Yeah. Any book, <laughs> right? Yep. for that matter. Uh, but that's what we do with scripture a lot. Okay, here's one verse. Let me take it out. Let me take it out of context, and then try to try to you know throw people off or figure out what that means. But you got to read the whole thing. Start mm-hmm. from the beginning mm-hmm. and read it to the end. <laughs> right? That's going to be very helpful. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So. As people are doing this, what tools, what if they're going, hey, I want to I want to understand the Bible more. Yeah. I want to not be afraid of it, intimidated by it. Um, what what tools are out there that you would recommend that would be helpful for somebody to understand context, to know some of the Jewish history, to know some of the, you know, who was this letter written to and by and when was it written and what was happening culturally at the time, sure. what was happening yeah. politically at the time, all of that. Where, where can somebody go to get yeah. some tools like that? I, I would also add quickly that uh, reading the Bible is a, is a lifelong process, mm-hmm. right? So don't... To go along with what you were saying, um, don't get frustrated and don't think that you have learned it all, right? Yeah. You're not done. It's living and active. It's changing you. Keep in it. Keep reading it. Psalm 1 actually says as you as you kind of continue to learn and embrace all of Scripture, you become like a tree of life for other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really important uh, that we just continue to let Scripture wash over us and we learn and learn and learn as we grow. Yeah. But yeah, some good resources. I think I mentioned the Bible Project earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's easy to to access. They have visual, a ton of yep. visual, a uh, ton of resources. Even going through each book of the Bible um, or themes, key themes, and mm-hmm. they have a podcast, which is great. Um, the book "How Not to Read the Bible" mm-hmm. is one that's really good, uh, so I'd recommend that. Um, another book we use in the uh, interpretation class is called "Reading Scripture with uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes." Mm-hmm. So anything like that that you can say, okay, you know, what is again, what is my encyclopedia like? Yep. What would have been the encyclopedia of the original readers or hearers? What is what do people even think about on the you know Eastern part of the world? Yep. Uh, and so how can I how can I glean a little bit more from that? Um, so as I'm approaching Scripture, I'm getting some of that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, I want to just jump back and then we'll we'll wrap up here. But you you mentioned make it a lifelong process. It is so important to understand that the Bible is living and active, yeah. and, it, and it it transforms our minds, it transforms our hearts, and that is an ongoing transformation that is lifelong. And you can read a passage of scripture 
and a month later or a year later, read the exact same passage and see something that you hadn't seen before. God will speak to you through it in ways that he hasn't spoken because you're a different person. Yeah. Even though the words don't change, you change. And our understanding and our, our experiences and, you know, it's one thing to talk about trials and suffering and go, okay, yeah, I understand that. What James says, you know, consider it pure joy when you face trials right, of various yeah. kinds. It's something different when you're going through the trial Definitely. or when you've come out of the trial. Now you understand that through a different context because you've actually experienced it. And so um, that is so important to to keep on going back to Scripture and yeah. going, okay, what does God have for me now? And, um, and to learn and to be open to. This is how God speaks to us. It's one of the primary ways that he speaks to us today. If you're like, ah, I feel like God's silent. Open your Bible. He'll yeah. speak to you. That's you know, right. he's yeah. he's there and he, he wants to speak to you through those those words that he's given to us. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, um, there's a really good book I read recently called Holy Sexuality, and the guy, the author's name is Christopher Yuan, and he became a Christian because he was in jail, mm -hmm. not a Christian, like 180 degrees opposed, mm -hmm. and he read a Bible verse etched on the on the wall of his prison cell, mm -hmm. and then he found a Bible in a trash can while he was in prison and became a Christian. Wow. It just shows you the power of the Word mm -hmm. of God is, is strong. Yeah. yeah. Justin, can you pray for us? And and I, I hope that as people are listening, hopefully this is inspiring you to go, I need to go open my Bible yeah. and see what see what I can learn. Um, would you pray for those that are going to take that step? I will. Thank specifically? You. Yeah. Dear Lord, thank you for your Word uh, that we have in Scripture. Uh, thank you for the, the freedom and the ability that we have to access it. I just pray that not only can the information that we talked about be helpful, but if who, whoever is listening, as they continue to want to learn more about you as, as disciples of you, uh, that we just continue to, to grow in your word, that we read, that we understand, that we can use resources and, and continue to just, you know, be refreshed uh, and grow through, through the reading of your word. So I just want to pray for everybody listening for everybody reading scripture, just illuminate them, open their eyes and help them see who you are and how you'd want us to live life as, as disciples of you and as people who want to be lights in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Loving God, Loving People podcast. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and click the bell so that you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this conversation, we'd love it if you like this video, leave us a comment, and even share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people meet, know, and follow Jesus. And lastly, you are always welcome to join us each week for one of our services right here live on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.